thank this fantastic group of speakers, Laura Rykovich, Carlos Mota, and Karol Radziewski for their participation tonight. I'm very grateful to the Polish Cultural Institute in New York for co-organizing and funding this program, and to Isabella Gola, the head of the Visual Arts Programming for initiating this talk in this key moment in time. I also want to acknowledge that Residency Unlimited has a long-standing relationship with the Polish Cultural Institute that goes all the way back to the Carol came for a residency at RU to develop his film America is Not Ready, where he retraced the tracks of the legendary feminist artist Natalia LL during her visit in New York in the 70s. So our relationship with Carol is almost a decade long. So it's amazing. And Carol is one of the most important artists working on queer themes. And his archive based methodology draws on a multitude of cultural, historical, religious, social, and gender related references. Since 2005, he is publisher and editor in chief of DIK Fagazine and is the founder of the Queer Archives Institute in 2015. Finally, in your long trajectory, Carol, impressive trajectory, you recently issued the book The Power of Secrets, featuring queer archival materials that formulate new ways of understanding history, memory, and legislation in Eastern Europe. So now um, I just want to mention that for the audience, if you have any questions, we will please put them in the chat and there will be a Q&A that follows this, this conversation. Thank you very, very much. Isabella, your turn. Natalie. Thank you so much for your warm welcome and uh, your warm remarks that also highlight our long-term partnership. And this uh, program, this series of talks is a result of this partnership. Um, this uh, series of talks is in response to the urgency of uh, recent events in the public domain in Poland and the USA including the unfortunate violence that have surged against the LGBTQ communities in Poland and the USA due to uh, hostile propaganda uh, that we all know about from the news. And I believe that the role of cultural institutions uh, is especially important now in these times of shakeup and polarized public discourse. And um, art often is the only way to communicate uh, when all modes of communication fail. And I feel very strongly that we need to support these kinds of initiatives. I would love to, and I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Carlos Mota, uh, who was born in Colombia, based in New York City, um, a historian of untold narratives and an archivist of repressed histories and struggles of post-colonial subjects and societies in South America and the USA. Earlier this year, Carlos recently published the first uh, comprehensive monograph titled Carlos Mota History Backrooms, documenting nearly 20 years of his interdisciplinary practice, which has launched at the Portland Institute uh, for Contemporary Art just last week. Welcome, Carlos. And I have the pleasure also to introduce uh, Laura Rajkovic, who is also going to be our moderator for today. Um, a curator, a writer, and an exceptional art professional, currently an interim director at the Leslie Lohmann Museum of Art, and the former executive director, uh, director at the Queen's Museum. Laura is the recipient of the uh, Rockefeller uh, Foundation Bellagio Fellowship and the inaugural uh, Emily Tremin Journalism Fellowship for Curators at Hyperallergic. And her book, which is coming up, um, Culture Strike, Art and Museums in the Age of Protest, uh, will be published by Verso in June 2021. Laura, I have the pleasure to um, introduce you and uh, give the floor to you right now. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, Isabella, for that lovely introduction. Um, thank you to everyone who organized this, um, this program, and especially to Carol and Carlos for, for being here tonight. I think we have a lot of really important ground to cover. Um, 
so I thought I would start by talking about one of the central ideas in my book that I think is really relevant to what Isabella kicked us off with around institutions and the power that art and culture plays, um, particularly in moments uh, such as these, um, where we have um, different ideological um, battlegrounds that are being played out in our daily lives. Um, you know, I think in, in conditions of the pandemic, uh, for example, the inequities that society delivers to us uh, are that much more palpable, that much more obvious, that much more clear, but they are what they have always been. Um, and um, when they come into high relief in that way, it becomes then what we do to respond to those conditions. Um, and I think in a sense, it's a time that we can really look um, and that it's important for culture to respond in very particular ways, um, particularly in recognizing that cultural space has never been neutral space. It's impossible. It's always um, been, it, it's always been a, a space of authority, right? Um, whether um, whether we're on that side of authority or not is another question. And I think, um, you know, some of the resistance and protests we've seen around cultural space it, are demands to make those spaces more equitable. Um, and I think that can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I think that there are ways that museums and cultural spaces become legitimizing forces for uh, previously mar or marginalized communities. So for example, the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art, which I am the interim director of until the wonderful Alyssa Nitchen takes over in, um, in, uh, in February, it was just announced that she'll be the, the permanent director there. Um, and I'm thrilled because I know Aly Alyssa really well and I think she's exactly who we need for the next phase of this institution. Um, but the reason that I think um, Leslie Lohman provides an interesting example is because it, it itself has not until very recently kind of been even super accepted into like the museum world. And it started from this very, outsider position, although it adopted all of the trappings of like what a museum is with its collection and its archives and its spaces. And so in a sense, like it took on the look of the institution to legitimize the queer content that it was, um, it was working with and kind of attempting to make space for in a much more conservative space, right? And so, um, you know, in a sense, it, it sort of turned the story on its head around what an institution could be and do by the very act of centering queerness as its kind of reason for being, right? Um, but within all of the things that look very much like a familiar museum, the work was just uh, coming from a place of queerness. And so, you know, I like to think about the queering of the institution um, of course, in terms of queerness specifically, but also in terms of how queerness is a, uh, is a call for radical, radical inclusion um, and care. So, you know, I think that there is a, there is a really um, kind of potent part of, um, you know, uh, of the, the, the kind of trajectory of the Leslie Lohman Museum, which recently you might know, um, was the official name of the museum had been the Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art. And, you know, I think that um, I, I wasn't there when the name was changed, but I came shortly thereafter. And, and the discussion around changing the name was a really pre peculiar one in a way, because it was felt that in a sense, gay and lesbian was too limiting for the, the kind of, um, generosity of queerness um, on one hand and then you know was but it was certainly tough for an older generation of gay and lesbian identifying people to kind of really think through what that meant in terms of gender spectrum etc so we 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 had all these kind of i mean the, the those conversations those tough conversation between like different subjectivities within this kind of uh, queer audience um, that, that the museum has always worked with were super 
were super robust, you know, even at the time that I started and they're still ongoing. So that's another interesting facet is that, you know, the kind of radicality, I think there were some older folks who were feeling like the radicality of the proposition of having a museum that was called the Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art was to actually point very specifically at this thing. And to them, it felt like we were taking something away uh, by making it more general in terms of museum of art. But in a sense, I think there was another view on this radical position of saying, oh, but we're actually making it a more radical position because what we're saying is that queerness is the future. And so one has to be working in this framework to understand where we're headed. So I bring these things up because they're a way of understanding a variety of tactics um, to both infiltrate existing institutions that maybe desire to exclude certain voices, but also the ways that there's a sort of surreptitiousness by which um, people who are marginalized can take power and control through those very devices that are attempting to exclude them, right? Um, so there's this question about like, how does the institutional scaffolding work both for and against um, the work that wants to be uh, viewed and seen and legitimized? Uh, because in a certain sense, there's um, a way that that institutional scaffolding can be a legitimizing factor, but at the same time, that those the, the undoing of that scaffolding, of that bias scaffolding is also what's necessary to realize this other future potential that we desire that is, that is queer, that is inclusive, that, that goes beyond, um, that goes beyond the status quo of the now, right? So I start with that. Um, and that's just kind of an offering, a framing to begin the conversation. And now Carol is going to go first and sort of talk for a few minutes about his work. Then Carlos will speak. And then well, the three of us will speak together for a while. We'll ask each other questions. And then, um, and then we'll throw it open for all of you to ask us some questions. Um, so just throw those in the chat when we come to that. But now, Carol, I hand it to you. Hello. <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you for everyone. Like, thank you, Natalie and Residence Unlimited for having me here and ISA and Polish Institute for the support for you, Lara, and also for Carlos. For me, it's very interesting because I exactly remember when Natalie told me, you have to meet this guy. And then I contact Carlos and it was 10 years ago and we met uh, exactly during my residency. So for me, it's like a really decade, but the circle, <laughs> but it's a uh, nice feeling. Okay, so I will just, um, I, I share the screen and I will pr present a few things from my work. So as an introduction, um, I hope it's visible full screen. Yeah. yeah, I hope it works as a full screen. So just to get back to the beginning, for me, 2005 was crucial. And uh, I think we're going to talk a lot about what we are, what I will be mentioning during the presentation. But basically, my feeling was when I graduated from the Academy of Fine Arts that I felt really unrepresented and there was not really a queer or even gay history in Poland. So every references I had during my study was just American, like Warhol, later on Wojnarowicz and, uh, and so on. So when I, uh, in 2005, made the exhibition called Fags, uh, it was announced as the first openly homosexual, first openly queer exhibition in the history of the country. So it's giving you, giving you also the perspective how short this history is. And for me, this uh, uh, missing narratives are really crucial for everything what I was doing later. The same year, 2005, I also started to running the, the magazine called Dick Fagazine. And it's ongoing project, although it's not that uh, regular. The idea was that it's supposed to focus on masculinity and homosexuality in Central Eastern Europe, because I quite quickly escaped just from Poland and tried to travel a lot and cover all the neighbor countries. So this issue with Donald Duck was the first that actually was summarizing more historical archival approach. And uh, 
summarizing also my trips. I work almost three years on that, um, that issue. And um, the basic um, kind of tool for all this uh, practice was oral history. So I was recording a lot of interviews with people who could remember something. I was visiting uh, mostly post-Soviet countries. So it was like Romania, Bulgaria, Latvia, Ukraine, Belarus, Yugoslavia, ex-Yugoslavia, so Serbia, Croatia, and so on. And uh, I realized that this history is completely missing. So it's just, I, I have to start somehow from the, from the beginning. And then uh, while working on this, um, on this uh, particular issue dedicated to the history, I met uh, a lot of people, but also some of them with the really rich archives, so especially Richard Kisho, who you could see the a very unique thing he created, Polish Gay Guide on the European Socialist Countries, like a handmade notebook uh, that he was uh, putting some notes about the cruising spots and places traveling around the whole Eastern Europe in the 70s and the 80s and taking photographs. So it was, I'm not going with the details, but it was really like for me, like the first kind of proto queer community that he created with the friends and how they were um, circulating the information. He also started one of the first uh, ever gay queer scenes in this part of Europe in 1986. He also had, he was a, he was working in a printing house and he was a kind of a photo amateur and with a group of friends, they were make a series of photographs that are kind of, I, I'm talking about it because it become a base for my whole kind of uh, archival artistic practice later on. We know each other since 2009. This is one of the photos. So he, they were basically, an underground, but they were not considering themselves as an artist. They were in the underground doing the photo shoots that were also very, uh, when I discovered them, I realized that there was not this kind of queer representation in Polish culture or any of the countries I visited before. So none any visual artists were covering this topic. So they were just doing this as uh, amateurs, like you see 85, 86, and also the AIDS HIV issue is present in this photographs, which is very early representation of that. Uh, issue in any images uh, in, po in Polish context. So also one of my first works uh, related to that archive was uh, a series of works titled AIDS. It's based on a small collage uh, from one of this uh, philosophy issues made by Richard Kishel in the eighties. He put the collage with Donald Duck. So that was this cheap kind of version of, sorry. Uh, something. Sorry. Uh, so that was this uh, stickers with the Donald Duck and it was kind of illegal cheap version of pop art in Eastern Europe. I remember at that time I was nine years old and I have them on my uh, notebooks or somewhere and Richard Kishel decided to make the AIDS uh, in the collage with AIDS in one of his zines. So I, referring to general idea, I transformed this collage into the series of works that for me, and that I think we'd also discuss, was this missing narration that there was not any art discovering the issue when it was happening, like the, not the issue, but pandemic. And then I create the work that's supposed to look like if there was an artist at that time could uh, create this kind of uh, piece. And also I was, and I'm still very interested in this uh, interference of the East and West uh, narrations and how this kind of works could um, circulate. Mm. Then uh, I will try to go quick through that so we not spend some time on the portfolio, but uh, based on these interviews and all the works that I did with Queer Archive Institute and based on the archive of Richard Kishel, I, I decided to start something that I called Queer Archives Institute. And at the beginning, I thought it would be only about Poland and Central Eastern Europe, but it happened that I was for a few months residency in Video Brazil in Sao Paulo. And I thought this is the great opportunity to just start something there. And also I immediately, when I came to Sao Paulo, I was uh, kind of uh, into the discussions about global South and global North. And I asked them, in, uh, the curators and the people I was talking with, if the, I came coming from Poland, if it's global South or North. And they were like uh, half half. So they said, no, of course it's South because you are colonized by the Russia and then, you know, Western Europe. So you are just like poor like us and so on. And then the other half said, no, no, of course you are just in European Union, you are North, you are Europe, you are rich. So it's like, so for me, it was very interesting because 
since I grown up, it was always this East West. I was always like Eastern European. And suddenly I realized that it's like a completely different geography. So I decided to make the first inauguration of the Foyer Archive Institute in, the, in, in Brazil and juxtapose the materials, mixing them from Eastern Europe and from the, mostly from uh, Brazil, but there were also some from Mexico and from Colombia, but not that many. And uh, the whole idea with Queer Archives was to gathering materials, but also to use, it's not an official foundation or association, it's like a performative institution that is based on the intervention. So I'm kind of occupying, depending on who is inviting me the spaces, doing installations, like here you see in Kyiv, Ukraine, the performance uh, in, uh, in Zagreb Contemporary Museum when I'm literally occupying part of the permanent collection. Or uh, I have never been to Colombia, but with my friend who on uh, Betancourt, who I also met when I was at the residency 10 years ago, he did the research and prepared the exhibition in, in Bogota in 2017 with performances and with the contribution from local community so for me it was really interesting how this started circulate or in Croatia and split when I work with the very local group and it was more focused on the specific group of people uh, and uh, so it's not always like a big museum it's really very playful the way I, I use this so-called institution uh, this is the exhibition uh, from Schwulis Museum how in Berlin uh, from the last year, from the, uh, from the festival that also Carlos took part. But it was interesting that Schulis Museum, we could compare to Leslie Loham uh, Museum, like it's the biggest or almost the only uh, queer museum in Europe with a huge collection. But they said that my show, it was the first time they were showing Eastern European uh, archives in their place, although they started in the beginning of the 80s. So, you know, and Berlin is like five hours, six hours by train from uh, Warsaw. So it was really interesting. Also in this geography, but this is the exhibition from, from this year that was shut down because of the lockdown, but I managed to open in Ljubljana in Slovenia. I collaborate with the Lesbian Archive, local Lesbian Archive, and it was really also interesting how the Lesbian Voices was much present than, for example, I could find in Poland. And uh, finally, the Warsaw, uh, this was the show that opened last year, but was going also to this year, it kind of retrospective of mine. I'm not showing everything, just a few things that was also the installation of Queer Archive Institute when I invite few artists to participate. And uh, the, the, the thing that was quite new for me that I started to work more with the painting, I was trained as a painter. So there was a series of portraits, 22 portraits of the most prominent um, uh, non-heteronormative figures from the culture, politics and history of Poland that were to, uh, grouped together as a gallery of portraits. And uh, I could talk a bit later about it, but I found it somehow this conservative painting medium, very challenging, but also very playful because all these images get back through the social media as a tool for some of the younger audience. I had a lot of feedback from very young people who were saying, oh, I just saw my, my, my mother that she didn't know that this 19th century writer, she was lesbian. And by the way, it's such a, such a cool, colorful portrait because we have just a black and white photo in the class. So, so that's also something that I explore a lot, how this, uh, how this medium could be used to share this narratives that was uh, repressed. And uh, also the oral story is still the base of my work. I think it's very similar to colors in the way that the voice of the people and particular participants uh, of the community is uh, crucial. This is one of the latest videos interview with Eva Hauschka. And it's very specific also example because she was the leading um, figure in the solidarity movement, the, the movement that uh, bring the freedom to Poland and the uh, ended up the communism, but she started to be really erased from the history of Poland and Polish culture and politics because of her transition, because she's also a transgender activist. And in 2000, she, had, she, made, she made a transition. So, so it was uh, seen as a kind of end of her, her, not really career, but presence in the, literally in the history. And uh, so I, I record like almost six hours interview with her the chronology of her life, but also use painting again to formulate the large scale poster that's replacing Valenza, Lev Valenza, the leader of solidarity with her figure to also make a kind of, not iconic, but like kind of an image that people could refer to the story and bring it to home with some kind of 
knowledge from the uh, show. So uh, I, I maybe a bit chaotic, but I will try to get back to some of these issues in the conversation later on. But that's a kind of crucial uh, for me now to bring the stories in a very strong visual representation and to, in that way, to reshift shift these narrations that are missing in uh, Polish or in the whole region. And uh, recently something interesting happened, and this definitely I want to talk a bit more later, uh, the new kind of activism appear in Poland. Maybe some of you heard it was covered in, in the media. The Margaret, the non-binary young activist was detained uh, by the police just with the anti-gay slogans and also because she put the rainbow flags on the some of the statues in the center of Warsaw and uh, her detention was uh, that there was a group of activists trying to protect her so at the end 48 people very young uh, queer people were arrested and uh, taken by the police and it was interesting for me that maybe also we'll get back to that later, that the, all the events that I was following in the past, in the communist times, there were never that kind of direct violence with the police. So, the, but because of that moment, so this is what you are seeing, it's a painting that I painted just uh, two weeks after the uh, events, because I thought there's so many missing events uh, in the, represent, in the art culture representation in the history. So who, if not me, will portray these events when they are just happening right now. And it also have a very good feedback from the people because the event was covered with a lot of photographs, but uh, somehow the significance of the medium that we used the painting was important for the people. But what I wanted to say that also this events with Margot, she finally she was released after two weeks. It was really like a whole long process, but she started kind of a new wave of the very young and very, on many levels. First, it, she introduced the uh, non-binary um, kind of vocabulary to the press, to the media, to the older generation of people. There was a lot of discussion about that. Also the way of being uh, challenging the police and all these things uh, resulted in what's happening now with the women's strikes that are going all over the Poland and how this, uh, the protests are much more intense and uh, brave and really the scale is, uh, like it's a awakeness of the young generation for the first, I don't know if for the very first time, but really in that scale in the brave uh, wave of uh, fighting for the women's rights, but also LGBT rights, the, it's really going together. So this event, it was 7th of uh, August, uh, are consider, and it's another issue, consider our Polish Stonewall. But this is the thing that I would like to discuss about uh, later, about what I'm calling rainbow colonization and the Stonewall rights and the symbol of rainbow, how it's perceived in this Eastern Europe and so on. So this I would like to get back, but I wanted to mention because it was kind of a crucial point in some way. Mm, so I could continue long, but I, I wanted to address some issues that we could explore later. and. At the end, I just wanted to, Natalie mentioned at the beginning, but this is the book that uh, just is going to printing and it will be um, ready in January, The Power of Secret, that's kind of summarizing everything I'm saying with the essays of the invited uh, uh, writers and critics and a lot of uh, visuals and also archival materials. So it will be in states distributed by, by MIT Press and it's published by Stenberg Press. So I'm just uh, showing you because this is a good opportunity. Maybe if you would be more interested in the stuff to get back to it. And I have a lot of thoughts, but I think I will end it up here to give the floor to Carlos and then we could switch to the conversation. So thank you very much. Thanks, Carol. Um, Oh, there's so much I want to ask you, but I'll save it for later. Carlos, why don't we jump to you and then we will we'll, we'll go through the common threads. Hmm? Sure. Uh, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Carol and Isabella, Natalie and everyone else at Residency Unlimited. It's nice to see you kind of, sort of, um, at a distance. And uh, it's, of course, a pleasure, Carol, to see you again. In fact, we have been circulating around each other for the last decade and running into each other in all kinds of different places. Um, I've been following what you're doing with great interest and I do indeed think that we have plenty of things in common. Um, the question of the archive has been central to my work as well. 
um, there are three ways I think in which I approach the question of the archive. One has to do with um, the writing of history and the role that historical archives and in particular criminal archives played in the construction of certain narr narratives and stories. Um, so I've been uh, very interested in digging into criminal archives, uh, particularly colonial archives in Colombia, Mexico, and other places um, that were established by Portuguese and the Spanish uh, crown throughout the conquest. Uh, and the reason I started to become interested in this is because I, I, I started to um, get a sense that the idea of the, uh, the, the subject that is othered based on their sexuality, gender, or behavior, uh, corresponded to a, a legacy that I very uh, immediately understood as a legacy of colonialism in the Americas. So when I went to these archives, I started to find mentions of the sodomite, the hermaphrodite, you know, uh, words and categories used in very diminishing ways to refer to uh, what did not correspond to the Christian, Judeo-Christian ethic, um, and also their understandings of legality and morality. So um, in the, with that regard, I, I understood that the archive was a site of opportunity in the sense that it did indeed show us the ways in which certain identities were um, defined um, in the past, but also a site of depriving of opportunity because certain identities are also known to us through the, that negative lens, right? Um, the life of a subject in an archive exists only because of the negation of that identity or the reduction of that identity to the category of the sodomite or the hermaphrodite. Even though uh, those people most likely had all kinds of lives and those who escape the archive escape the burden of the violence of being named. So I wanted to um, sort of like think about the archive in that sense, a site uh, that is a repository of violence. And in that sense, uh, that, that same situation could be extrapolated and conceptualized in the context of the art museum. So I also started to look at the at museum collections, particularly anthropological and ethnographic collections of encyclopedic museums, such as the Metropolitan Museum or the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, the Louvre, the Museo, Museo Nacional in Colombia and others. Um, and in particular, the ways in which pre-Hispanic objects, objects made by uh, uh, pre-Hispanic cultures um, um, that represented sexual relationships uh, were very often discussed, let alone showed, shown in exhibitions. So I had to like really find them deep in the, in the vaults of the museums and also understand how these exclusions had to do with a very systematic choice of not presenting these works because they did not reproduce the heteronormative narrative that uh, archaeology and anthropology had described to. Um, so with that framework, I have made a series of works um, that look at these histories, uh, create alternative stories around sexual and gender difference based on these objects and these stories found in the archives. I'm showing a piece called Towards Homoerotic Historiography, which basically is um, an installation that mimics a very formalized um, museum installation inside a contemporary art museum. The reference here is a room that you would find, for example, that at an exhibition at the Louvre or something like that in the kind of uh, formalis formalism of uh, the paint and the use of carpet and things like that, as well as the presentation of these light boxes, really formalized light boxes that are embedded onto the walls, uh, onto which the audience upon closer examination will find these miniature replicas, these thin, very, very small replicas uh, made in gold that represent some of these homoerotic encounters of uh, uh, depicted by different Hispanic cultures. The idea, of course, was to create an alternative narrative of these objects, those objects that, has, that have been uh, very consciously not presented and excluded from that historical uh, narration. Um, let's see what else about this. 
This uh, image here is a related project from a video called Desires. This is actually the first page of the legal document, the criminal document of someone whose name was Martina Parra, who was uh, prosecuted, criminalized, and tried for being a hermaphrodite and having an unnatural body. It is a fairly complicated story. I don't have time to get into right now, but I just wanted to show the ways in which the document here, the document that is excerpted from, from the archive becomes also the point of departure for me to fictionalize, confront, engage, and problematize the ways in which these identities have been defined by uh, history, historiography. Um, I'm interested in um, giving uh, these subjects subjectivity and agency in a field that has entirely denied subjectivity and agency to this. Um... Sorry, I need to get disconnected. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, my headphones died. And um, so my idea with this project is to was to uh, give voice to some of the sub subjects that have been uh, buried in these archives and and create the possibility of a story having a happy ending or having a fantasy life or having things that are only at this point granted to heterosexuals in history uh, and not to, to subjects that have been erased because of their alterity or difference. Another way in which I have uh, uh, engaged with the creation of archives has been more along the lines of some of uh, uh, the projects that Carol described that have to do with uh, oral histories and archives. This is a project called We Who Feel Differently. I created in 2012 for an exhibition at the New Museum in New York, where I wanted to uh, situate the conversation around the equality framework in LGBT rights and, and confront it with uh, the more radical idea of difference as it had been formulated in the late 1950s, 60s, and 70s by uh, sex, gender, and feminist activists. What is the idea of difference if not an opportunity to articulate a different place in the world? One that is not based on uh, begging for inclusion, but actually carving out a, a space that is, that is not uh, asking for tolerance, it's actually claiming a different space. It's a different, a different and parallel time, so to speak. Uh, the way in which I have used uh, space in museums is often uh, drawing from the, the, the central uh, cultural capital of the museum and what it offers as a site. Uh, so I'm interested in creating a space that can be activated as a community resource. As you, what you see here is the installation being activated by a series of events that were created once a month every Thursday. So we brought people from the community to speak about a, a myriad of issues, including queer theology, um, inclusion of gays in the military, uh, queer literature and other things. But the, the project itself is also an archive that is composed of about 60 interviews with activists from the 19, the first place from 1958 through 2012 in four different countries around the world. And that has been nine minutes and 30 seconds. So I'm gonna stop there skipping a few things, but uh, hopefully we can get back to some of the ideas I discussed in, in conversation. That's great, thank you. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. <laughs> um, that was really wonderful. Thank you for the... Um, for the speed date, Carol and Carlos. <laughs> um, so um, you both had me thinking about this um, Ariella Azule book that came out last year. Um, and uh, it's called, what is it called? I'm looking at it, I can't quite see. It's called like Unlearning History, uh, Undoing Imperialism or something like that. Anyway, I highly recommend it. It's a really amazing book. And part of what made me think both of you talked about this idea of kind of um, 
you know, reinscribing in the archive the, 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 the missing stories, but also this kind of idea that we might transport ourselves uh, into a position of solidarity with those individuals. And I think, you know, uh, Carol, by, you know, the portraits that you painted of Polish figures um, throughout history um, that gave them like a, a different kind of humanity than the the, the the black and white photo from some kind of textbook or a dictionary or or encyclopedia or Carlos the kind of um, the kind of imagined potential future that you uh, that you kind of described um, in in your work I don't know maybe talk a little bit more about that piece and maybe Carol you can start by talking about what this all kind of means in the context of contemporary Poland and how um, you know the, the the kind of shifts in um, well just the right wing uh, slide of the the government has kind of particularly penetrated into the into spaces of resistance and how you know, why these kinds of retrievals are that much more important now, you know, like how that's functioning in a kind of real way, of, you know, in, a, in life. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I'm thinking a lot and also maybe I talk a bit about it later, how much the history it's already, and this is would be also my question for Carlos, how he feels this, uh, what we are doing and dealing with history, how it really works and help, because I have a feeling that also the Poland is a bit in a different moment now. Like uh, people are not that much interested in history. This is something that like a work for the future, maybe for the few years. I'm used to say like, I'm working on what will be in the books in 10, 15 years, but they don't see it yet. But uh, everything I done in, starting 2005 was in the direct reaction to the government that was the same party in the ruling like now. So it was, this is this, maybe this impulse that uh, I made this first open gay show in the history of the country. And now this riots that I mentioned because the pressure was so high, but uh, I always trying to think because it's, I'm working on it some, for some time already on the layers. Like there is this wave of the activism and then what's the next step. So for example, in my show, I decided to not show any things related to the church. Maybe I should mention that for the other audience that Poland is very monoculture, very Catholic religion is so present that it's not that much diverse. And this is the um, very important factor re related to the current homophobia of, of the government because the whole politicians are so connected with the church. So I decided in my show not talking about that to just kind of trying to show the positive or the possible he heroines and heroes. And that is what I'm trying to do also with the activists who are appearing just from the crowd now to give them visibility and to kind of support them in that way that you could build the image that would stay a bit uh, longer. Also, the, there was a really interesting case with one of the writers, like Maria Konopnitska, 19th century writer. She, she's the out, she was a, I don't know if she was nationalist, but she was like a good patriot. And she, it was really interesting. She divorced in, it was 19th century, she divorced and she was living with women for 27 years. But she's an author of the most celebrated by the nationalist poem. It's like an, an alternative anathem about how Poland is great. And they get, when the first time they started as a community say like, oh, but you know, she was lesbian. They get furious. They didn't believe. And then suddenly kind of, it was really visible how we, they start to, they kind of stopped using her, her poem because there was such a strong pressure to prove that she was part of the LGBT community. And our government, the president constantly saying that like, LGBT is ideology is worse than the communism. So when you are putting these figures, you completely, this is what I maybe not mentioned, that the, his, the uh, politics of history are crucial tools for the our government to kind of manipulate people to shift their discourse. And this is how somehow that kind of pushed me to make paintings, to kind of use their language to reverse the narration. That's kind of succeed when you have the possibility to show in the public institutions, then you could kind of expose these images and the stories that are uh, kind of stealing from them, like getting back our 
our people. The, just last week, there was a big discussion because the new interpretation about the letters of correspondence of Frédéric Chopin appears that he was probably gay. So it's like a big, big discussion around that. So I, I, I see also this uh, very connected with the current protest, how people could uh, bro, uh, like use it for the for their uh, kind of agenda and support their um, voices and yeah. Thanks, Carol. Carlos, I'm curious as to how you think about that, that kind of like standing beside the person who you're, who, whose history you're retrieving from this obscurity, even if you're kind of forced to invent it, you know, um, how does that work for you? Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking as I was listening to Carol speak that um, a lot of LGBTQ I plus histories has been um, the idea of desiring being included in narratives, right, in, in historical accounts. Um, but from the perspective of these archives that I have visited, I think the most radical uh, action uh, actually was to escape being mentioned at all, is the idea of radical obscurity and not existing, not being named. Having said that, and understanding the power of representation, I think what's more critical is perhaps to stop seeking representation on the terms that we know and, and pushing what I think has become much more um, understood and developed these days, which is the act of self-representation. Uh, I don't care the way that a museum will represent me or how I exist in a collection or the work that I do. I care about the terms that I employ to tell my story. And I think that that is, a, that is a really important queer gesture that we need to be thinking about. It's less about, because I really think that this idea of begging to be included um, at this meal of this table where you have actually nothing in common with is less interesting than presenting how there is a whole different feast of meals happening on this side um, and that you may not be invited to. And you, yeah. are, you actually don't have, you, you don't play a part and I don't want you to be there. And I always want you, Laura, to be anywhere I go, but, <laughs> but just, you know what I mean? So in that sense, I feel that, I feel that um, the, the, the more radical gest gestures actually might be staying under the covers, not speaking so loudly, creating your own stories uh, on the side. I feel that the most, some of the most radical organizations nowadays are those that have done precisely that. I mean, in the fields of, of social uh, justice and activism are people who have really organized on their own terms. They are mostly uh, trans and intersex groups, I think at this point who are doing that, but who have created a very different set of urgencies for themselves. Um, and now, and that will exploit the system to be able to, to fulfill them. So I'll, I'll just leave that there as, a, as a, an offering, as a provo provocation also, which we'll see what you think. I love, I love what you just said, because it reminds me of this Octavia Butler quote that, that, that she said, there's nothing new under the sun, but there are other suns. And I think that this is an extremely um, important impetus in this particular political moment because we've seen how failed our systems and institutions are. And so how does one remake them? How does one undo them and redo them? You know, and, and this kind of, all of this talk about in inclusion and, and uh, equity and all of this is all really important, but it means that we, we cannot continue to function within the institutions as they currently exist. Like the current configuration is the problem. <laughs> it's that we have to recognize that the institutions relay the politics and ideologies of the status quo, of this political moment, of the histories that have been privileged above all else, of, of capitalism, of, you know, all of these things intersect in a very profound way within our institutions. And the only way to actually accomplish any of this is by acknowledging the fact that they have to be undone and redone in order to, to actually attempt 
any form of inclusion on one hand. And I also think in parallel to that, that Carlos, what you're saying is so profoundly important that, that, that all of this doesn't have to happen in this like kumbaya moment. Um, it can also happen in these kind of universes that we create for ourselves that may exclude some people that actually allows for disagreements or Chantal Mouffe might say agonisms, you know, like that, that we don't always have, there are some things that we have to be apart for and that's okay. And that just like, if I can, like for me personally as Laura, like if I can say, you know what, I'm going to shut my mouth. I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to not share my desires for a moment, just for a moment, like hold it back and just maybe see what else can be if I kind of hold back my positionality just for a moment. And I think there's an incredible um, kind of, you know, I think like leadership and all of the, and success and all of these things that have been so defined in the 20th century in particular, but, you know, obviously have long past histories and roots in colonialism and the ways in which capital has operated globally for centuries. But I think the way that they've come to us now, it, they feel so thin, they feel so potentially rupturable. Um, and that's what I feel like both of you are doing in terms of the art that you're presenting is, is saying, this might be a space for this rupture. And if you wanna kind of talk about it, you can you know, come and hang out for a minute in my world. You know? And that's why I think both of your work is really important because it's sort of speaking to that. It's connected to these realities of, of life, of the day-to-day, -day, of what it means to escape from the archive, to not be counted, to, to, be, to be elusive, to not be, um, and also what it means to be repositioned in a public sense to say, well, no, I actually am going to, you know, I'm going to paint a new portrait of this person so that they, they cannot be removed. There, there is something else regarding that, which I think is really important to talk about and I think about more and more, which has to do with the fact that representation is a part of that system that is ruptured and broken, right, that we need to fix. And we as artists exist in these systems of representation and are presented by institutions that are constrained by representation, literally the exposition of things. And one of the things that, I, that I'm uh, more and more interested in is in breaking down the idea of aesthetics as something that is somewhat neutral. Because aesthetics is absolutely not neutral, right? Aesthetics is a colonized, a colonized field that needs to be disarticulated and broken down from within. So for someone like me who inhabits a certain, uh, certain, a kind of paradoxical position where I have a place in the mainstream institution, I have, I, I have um, been, I have carved myself and also been granted access to certain discourses, uh, it becomes an interesting exercise to, to fight against the demands of the institution onto a practice. Uh, so what, I, what I'm interested in is thinking about how in that confrontation, you can also point to people to understanding that knowledge and aesthetics as a form of knowledge creation is something that we have to also disarticulate and break. Um, and we, we, in that process, you will lose many of your heroes. I've been looking, for example, at, at, at artists that I held very close to my, my heart until I understood that the language they speak is a language of colonization, that they're seeking to create a critical reflection through a language that seeks to empathy and beauty in the most formalist terms anchored in a, in a kind of modernist uh, tradition, right? So how do you create that reflection when you are speaking that language that had, has created otherwise the conditions of oppression? And I hope that that is more or less clear to me, but. I want to every time more and more make sure that each one of those discourses, these discourses that we use, aesthetic as a platform in the inst inst institutional context, uh, need to be broken down and sort of like rewritten. I don't know if I will be able to do that because I'm like knee deep in the institutional context at this point in my life, but at least I have the intent of not wanting to exist and speak using that language that I think needs to be reconsidered. 
Well, I think that's really what you're saying is really important because of course we're all complicit within institutions, um, all of us in one way or another. I mean, there is no uh, Lily White. I mean, I wouldn't even want to be that Lily White thing. Or, you know, I, I like being a little bit scruffy. So, you know, I, I, I don't think that there, is, there isn't, um, there isn't a pure positionality, but I do think that there is always a moment where we acknowledge within institutions, within our lives, that one has to, that, that a line has been crossed and that one has to therefore withdraw. Um, and that is also a radical act. And so, you know, I guess, I guess the question becomes then, you know, uh, you know, and, and maybe Carol, you can talk about this too. I also have a practical question for Carol. I wondered if, um, you recon if the if the items in the archive in your archive are kept together, do they exist as a group or are they assembled where you go and then redistributed back to wherever they came from? Like, does it exist as a thing? But also, like, at what point do you decide? You know, wh where are the lines? Where are the lines that become inviolable? Where you where you must say, no, I withdraw. I withdraw my creativity. I withdraw my work, or I withdraw myself from this conversation because I, the 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 conflict is too great, or I I can't navigate it any further. Like, has that ever come up for you? Just to answer about the objects, it's like a quite big collection, and I keep them all together. But it, the the name of the queer archives is plural because it's more about the collaboration with the several archives in particular countries. So when I work in particular country, there is exhibition of the uh, objects, but they are stay in the local context, and I'm doing like digitalization of them to 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 put them in the uh, bigger part. But basically, the the one that is uh, dedicated to Poland, it's uh, in one place, and also the collection of zines and magazines that I'm holding as a collection. But uh, yeah, I completely agree with Carlos, but I, also for me, it's very confusing for myself because I found that myself in a position that in Poland, Eastern Europe, everything is just starting. And for example, regarding the um, uh, activism and LGBT activism, and uh, it's somehow, um, I, I, I also live in a more like global world and the art world, but when you are in your kind of um, place, there is a big need for the representation for people. And all my art at the beginning was very personal, very about me. And then it was also the trap because it was so easy for the curators to put this discourse like, oh, you're a poor, poor little gay boy from the small town. And you know, it's the whole this narration. It was really hard to escape. It was, they, they were, really like patronizing you not saying oh you don't really do the art you don't do the you know uh discourse and so on because you are just saying uh, your sad story but uh, this is the other thing but what i wanted to say that for people are really contacting me and asking for um uh, like a I, I would call it like representation because they don't see it uh, in a local context this is coming to this what i mentioned like rainbow colonization. I don't want to demonize it, but there is something like uh, the biggest and more active queer group in Poland is called Stonewall Group, like literally Stonewall, not like um, any local name or not in Polish, but Stonewall. Also the rainbow flag become uh, really like a common symbol and uh, there is a big lack of, like any lack of the, um, history and then when you have really young people from the smaller towns that the, they know about RuPaul Drag Race, the Stonewall, and this is this package that they have and for them any kind of representation that is different, more local, is kind of work, make the work. I remember like there is this text of Richard Kim who, who said queer history is my queer present because what you learn and what you heard about the stories it's kind of shape you and I think in Poland there is a kind of this moment that people need the story to somehow uh, kind of start something like their own identity maybe it's an illusion and <laughs> I think probably Carlos will not agree with that but maybe it's a kind of moment in time that I feel we are I don't know well I never think it's a question of either or I think it's both and and I think that you know I think even I see in Carlos's practice both of those threads um you know I don't think uh you know and I don't think you have to 
you know, I don't think you have to abandon one to practice the other. Um, and I think that they're both really important nodes um, in, um, in just all of our lives. Like, you know, as we were saying, you can't help but be complicit in some of these systems. And yet we know that we're all working, well, not all of us, but some of us are trying to work against them simultaneously. And I think it's that friction between the working on the inside, the 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 kind of what you hold back, what you withdraw from, what you, uh, what you hide away, and then what you give. And I think it's always this negotiation between the two. And I think, you know, I think Carol, you're right. I think that there are certain circumstances in which you have to be super direct and super clear about what the representation is and how it is uh, presented. And, you know, and I think, yeah, of course, it's important for people to have other images of queer life other than Drag Race and Stonewall. I mean, I think those are two really tiny aspects of, of what queer representation uh, is and could be. But I also think that there's a moment in which, yes, there, you know, there, there, there could be a moment of, um, of, of radical uh, withdrawal to, to the, with the aim of um, of saying or radical obscurity, as as Carla said, um, in order to reframe the entire question of representation and to re retell the story completely. Um, and I don't. I mean, I don't know that. I mean, I don't know, Carlos, if you kind of have a sense of what that looks like. I don't really know what that looks like, but I think that art can do it, and it it is doing it on various registers. It's just. Um, you know, it's going to take us a while to sometimes see that, and I think that's kind of that's kind of the beauty of of where of, of of what culture does. You know, it kind of evolves our ways of seeing, and so you know, this kind of give and take that that both of you are talking about in terms of like, what do I show? What do I not show? How do I operate in the archive? What does using the archive even as a tool mean? I mean, at the same time that Carlos is talking about you know, radical obscurity is also talking about like reading these archives and understanding, you know, what they hold and what they don't hold. And so, you know, it's like it, the same material, these are tactics that we use to, to engage with a material world that is trying to restrain us as to who we are and how we tell our stories. And so like, there's a way that you can participate in that and undermine it, but also participate in it um, in a much, in a sneakier way <laughs> to kind of, you know, look at things differently. And Carlos, I, I think a lot about your project um, at the Stadlick Museum. Was it there that you did the project where you like worked with the objects in the collection as well as the immigrant stories? I thought that project was really interesting because you basically told the story of colonization the, the, the history of colonization through contemporary stories of LGBTQ people who had become asylum seekers in the Netherlands, um, you know, and some of them perhaps were lying about their identity in order to seek asylum. And so that was even like this bigger narrative about, I don't know, maybe you can say a few things about that because I think that sort of demonstrates this kind of inside outside withdrawal you know, representation question. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Carol. Carol, I think, um, I mean, I, I offer that thing about obscurity and non-representation as a, as a provocation, but of course it's one that we, you, we have to work with and, and see to what extent it makes sense. It, oftentimes a provocation like this, um, um, let's see, undermines the privilege to speak and to be represented, right? And so I feel like we also have to acknowledge the fact that so many people out there, lives and livelihood depends on being represented. Uh, at the same time, because I am dealing with these questions and, and finding ways to tell stories, the idea of withdrawal and obscurity and you know, echoing the work, I think I'm really thinking of the work of the Martinican philosopher, Edouard Guisson, who's the person who was speaking about this kind of uh, radical obscurity that I'm interested in. However, I do. I think, for example, that the work that you are doing, Carol, in in going through these archives and constructing a history that isn't or that wasn't right, that we have access to knowing the ways in which certain people lived 
in Poland and elsewhere at, at certain times is of, it's absolutely critical, right? We need to know those histories and you need to know those histories as someone who is growing up in Poland uh, and feels that has no role models. So having said that, it is, it is not, and I'm here with Laura, is not an either or, it's an and, like we need to be thinking about both these things. There is a, a radical element. I wish the, the LGBT organization in Poland was not called Stonewall. I wish, I really wish it was called Dick Faxing because I think you have created the radical movement uh, to some extent there through the work that you have done. Uh, so that, that was just to make that clear. And in relationship to that, to what you are saying about the project at the Steadly Clauda, it is a project just for people's clarity very quick, um, where I worked with an organization called um, Secret Garden, who's an organization that assists uh, people who are seeking asylum on the basis of sex and gender uh, to get settled in the Netherlands once they undergo those processes. And so the, pro the project is composed of 11 video testimonials by people who have been going through this process and at the same time there is a presentation of historical objects drawn from four collections of um, encyclopedic museums in Amsterdam including the World, Co World Cultures Museum, the, the Rijks Museum, the Amsterdam Museum and what we wanted to do with the uh, historian and curator that assist that helped me and collaborated with me in this process was to tell the story of colonization, which we were seeing reflected in the story, in the contemporary story of the LGBT asylum seekers through objects and the ways in which these objects have been archived and presented in the museum collections. So we could have a kind of mirror to look at the ways in which there are certain kind of government policies of hypocrisy that become very clear. Certain things about, you know, um, fighting for the rights of, the, of LGBT subjects and women on the one hand, but being blatantly racist and xenophobic on the other one. So like these kinds of things became very clear in juxtaposing objects and living uh, testimony in the site in the side of the museum. And I, I like the idea that the museum itself became a kind of monument to these lives, uh, and which is not oftentimes the, the, the the role of a museum, right? The museum presents, but not necessarily memorializes or mon monumentalizes something like that. Um, yeah, so that's what that project was. I think it was about both things, about revealing those things that remain hidden and at the same time framing a discourse that was happening in the present. Well, why don't we um, open it up to some questions from the rest of you, since I'm sure there are some burning questions out there. And I have one, I see one already in the chat from Peter M to everyone. Uh, open question, he writes, um, is there a line that your projects will not cross uh, when it comes to, uh, sorry, when it comes to your projects with a possible social or government backlash? I mean, maybe just to, I don't know if this is what you intended, Peter, but like, you know, I think Carol, you mentioned, you know, the Catholic church and, and how that, um, you know, kind of work related to that might be received in Poland. Like, are there lines that you, um, that you don't think about crossing? Peter, you know, you can turn your mic on if you want and, and re reframe the question if you'd like, if that's not the path that you meant. But you mean literally what you can't do? <laughs> oh, this is we are experiencing a lot during this protest because all it's going to absurd. Like the gestures that are like you know literally putting the piece of uh, material like a, paint, a rainbow flag on the metal statue, not doing anything, not even painting that. It's become a crime because of the next to the church or something. So it's like really going to the craziness like recent uh, weeks so it don't have to be like you born the cross it could be like anything like just yesterday there was a couple and uh, uh, the wife was at the protest and the husband was free with three kids in the flat and there was a polish flag hanging from the balcony but they put the symbol on the flag of this um this protest symbol and the police inter intervene in the flag because they said that it's uh What's the what's the word like? It's um, it's against the Polish symbols, something like that. But they came, you know, and there was a 
guy with the kids and it was so it's really going to the absurd if you ask the borders and the show i was showing uh, documentation from the uyazdowski castle center for contemporary art that was interesting case because uh they the, the recent um, director change, and there was not uh, the pressure from the director or the curator, but they used the public TV to kind of tr push me to close down the show. So they were they were calling me, recording my phone calls. They were waiting with the cameras in front of the toilet. I will uh, when I was inside to just build a material that will be showing me in a bad a bad way so the, I, they will force me to close the show so it's really like um, we are in the moment that it's almost many older people think like it's like a communist time like anything you would cross a bit just being not nice for someone it could be too much mm. if that was the question sorry I just <laughs> maybe I don't think that's Carlos have you have you uh, encountered this in a this kind of or maybe we should move on to another question. There's a, actually another question here um, uh, um, for everyone. It, it seems uh, it's from Michael Borowski. Borowski. Um, it seems there's such a broad mistrust of centralized or institutional knowledge currently from both progressive and conservative perspectives. Do you worry about this or think it is a necessary step forward? What's your hope for institutions role in the future? Um, I guess I, I'll answer that. Should be okay. for you. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I think that um, I think that the basis upon which institutions have been built has been uh, highly biased um, and um, in perpetuation of the dominant cultures. So um, that's what has to be undressed and undone before I think people will begin to, um, you know, I, I'm not particular, to be honest with you, I'm not particularly interested in fascists. I, you know, I'm not, uh, yeah, I don't think we have a responsibility to um, engage with them. They're just fascists uh, and I, won't do that. That's a that is a limit for me. But I do think that um, from the other side of the coin, I, I do think that there is a real need to to address the biases that are embedded there. Um, let's see. Here's another good one. Uh, let's see where did it go. Uh, it, uh, Jay Myers uh, Supinska says, thanks all for the interesting conversation. Carol, do you have a sense that the recent wave of feminist protests has had or will have any positive effect on Polish art institutions and their relation to the conservative government? Are you hopeful that cultural changes might be coming or worried about further trouble and repression? And I guess I would add to that, is there, is there like a co-conspiratorship between the feminist and LGBTQ uh, protests at this point? Like how, how has that, has that, that the intersectionality of those struggles um, like merged in any way? So I'll just add my part of that question. Yeah, it's a very good question, but also a difficult one. I, I would say positively that there is this connection and intersectionality and then the, the leader of the whole protest, the women protest movement, is she's openly lesbian, and that was pointed out in the articles. But in the same, on the other hand, there is a really weird moment happening that uh, the transphobia appears, and not the the kind of like non-binary people. Like I mean, the the, the more radical queer community wanted to really address that this is the protest about everybody could have a need abortion, not just uh, cis women. And that, you know, make the, the discussion. And that's what the government wants. And like, they even wanted to make this conflict inside of the groups. But you, you know that from all the countries, stories and so on. But that was, uh, but I, I would say that it's not, uh, the, 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 um, it's, it's rather uh, going together and it's not, it's like a not niche, but it's like a, just some percentage of people have the issues with that. But for me, it was interesting for the first time to see that kind of conflict inside of the uh, protest, not, uh, and, and the first part of the question was about the culture world. Actually, the, that's also the thing that Poland, uh, basic Eastern Europe, so Eastern <laughs> Europe is different than America because everything is, uh, institutionalized, not really based on the private money. So it was also an interesting issue how 
I, I read the interview with you recently and I, I, I um, also thought about it, how you think this would change if there would be less private money, while in Poland we're just discussing that only private money at that moment could help to survive the independent radical culture because everything is dependent on so much on the public uh, city galleries and uh, grants that artists can't function anyhow because the art market is so little and so small so there is the only chance that you are supported by the government. So this strikes, I don't think they will change the culture field because it's so little somehow that it's not strong enough to be and basically it's on our side i would say but it just not have is the voice strong enough yeah i mean just to clarify i think that if any particular universe gains more power within culture through because they pull the strings of funding right if it's the private sector or the public sector yeah, yeah. if they're not balanced in some way i yeah, think yeah. that that's when you have issues you know i think public accountability is good when you have an over uh, zealous uh, and controlling private sector i think some private uh, you know is, is you know yeah. i think it's about a, a rebalancing and also maybe a reinventing of how we imagine um yeah, that that's what, but that's a much bigger that's a much bigger conversation and i want to get to a couple of these other questions um jules rock uh, roscom asks um carlos has spoken of the potential violences of representation i'm wondering if he and or carol would be interested in speaking to the potential violences of narrative much like subjects are compelled to visualize themselves they are also compelled to narrate their lives using the language of the dominant culture which may not be their own good question I agree. I think it's a good question, but I don't exactly understand the end of the question. And Jules, if you wouldn't mind maybe speaking up and saying what you mean by that last part, because I don't see how the, I mean, uh, narrative is a form of representation. So how is this a different set of issues? Is it possible for to get some clarification? Because I, I, I really want to engage this question. I just want to do it in yeah. Awareness. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I guess, I, I mean, you sort of named uh, <clears throat> a little bit of, of what I was trying to bring up, which is, I felt like what we were, what was being discussed earlier was in the realm of the visual, the, the sort of um, thinking about aesthetics um, um, in the visual sense. And so I guess I was thinking, I was trying to bring into the conversation narrative as also an aesthetic and and as a structure um, and that um, even thinking about how we tell a story of a life is structured in a particular way um, that only acknowledges certain aspects of life as worth mentioning. Um, so like in a heteronormative context, like getting married, having children, uh, et cetera. So I, I guess I was just curious about thinking about how, how either of you use strategies to intervene in that kind of violence that a narrative structure does. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, um, this, there is a, a strong violence that happens in wanting to narrative an experience, especially an experience that comes from somewhere else in this process, this project that um, Laura was mentioning, I worked on in the Netherlands. There was um, a moment in which we had to discuss the terms that were expected for the asylum seekers to use to narrativize their lives so that they would be considered for asylum, right? There were specific uh, things that they were expected to tell, specific arches, if you will, of, of, um, of tragedy and of encountering blocks along every step of the, of the way, even if those things were true, they needed to be discussed and narrated using a specific kind of language that would fit them as candidates for asylum, right? And some people were really puzzled around this because they were like, okay, so I have to like tell my story on these terms because of course I wanna get this thing that I'm applying to, but at the same time, I'm being subjected to telling my story in a way that that further victimizes me and renders my, my story into a, a certain kind of institutional commodity. 
Um, so I just say that because I feel like that is a trap that a lot of people working in documentary strategies fall for, right? They will reproduce that language thinking that they're giving a voice when what they're doing is really reproducing a cycle of violences that are imposed on the, a person, a subject, a victim. Uh, and I think it's really important for uh, someone who's engaging in this kind of work to understand the, 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 the boundaries and critically break down those things, understand them, to not reproduce them, right? So I, I hope that uh, engages somewhat what you're saying, but I feel that uh, for me, it has been always incredibly important to understand that, that the form of narrative that I'm using is a critical element. And as a critical element, it needs to be very st strategically articulated. It's not just something you, you use because it will visualize. It's something that you use because it will create a different set of meanings to engage with that specific subject or question. Thanks, Carlos. I think actually, Mateus Duivis, if I said your name properly, I'm sorry, <laughs> improperly, I'm sorry, um, says has something to say about funding from the Netherlands, which is actually, I think, related to this point. And he writes, the Netherlands have proposed to the European Committee to block major and crucial European funding of Poland as long as the Polish government tolerates so-called gay-free municipalities. The support of the European Parliament for this proposal is set. LGBT art projects in Poland that will be obstructed or forbidden by Poland will immediately be pol politicized with the support of the Dutch government, uh, Dutch government related groups in defense of the constitutional state. So please document the artistic resistance and counter reaction carefully. If I'm reading this correctly, I think what Matthias is trying to say is that, you know, the, the kind of politicization of certain uh, certain actions could be perceived inappropriately and therefore be censored or censured by a variety of different players. So like, for example, I think one of the things that Carlos was trying to speak to with the relationship to the project at the Stadlik was that in a sense, like the asylum seekers couldn't, had to adopt this language because they couldn't compromise their the potential to actually receive asylum. And so they had to buy into that you know, way of telling the story. Um, I don't know, I don't know, uh, Carol, if this statement from Matthias makes sense to you or if you have another reaction to it, given, you know, what's actually happening in Poland. Well, I could just maybe, it's hard for me to make comment more like I give you the example there. There's one activist who really made the noise around this uh, free LGBT zones in Poland. And then there was, this potential reaction, but uh, immediately government said, like, we give double money for those places because this is our agenda. So when you go work in almost kind of dictatorship, they don't care. It's just like not working. And this is really sad when you talk about European Union. So um, yeah, it's more complicated somehow. It's like the whole political game around it. Yeah, and I think I, I think one of the things that I've learned working, uh, you know, internationally for a really long time is that the, the the situations on the ground are often really complex in ways that no one really can understand, <laughs> um, especially somebody coming from outside. And so, you know, just the the level of care that as people who work across borders and boundaries all the time, um, you know, there's a specific type of care that one needs to take in terms of, you know, really understanding the conditions so that we don't put in danger people who we, uh, you know, are attempting to support. So I, I just, I guess, say that. Um, there's a question from Alpesh Patel, um, and maybe this will be the last question. So I'm sorry if we didn't get to yours, but um, it says, uh, Alpesh asks, we might be out of time, but Carlos, I've been really inspired by Glissant to think about new ways to write art histories, ones that allow yours and Carol's work to be seen in one frame, for instance. Given you mentioned Glissant and radical obscurity, could you speak more about his concept of opacity provides a new way of thinking about representation for you in your practice? In like, you know, two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alpesh, nice to read you. I haven't seen you in so long. Um, you know, I have to admit, I am new to Glissant. I discovered Glissant about a year and a half ago, and I've been just devouring and learning and learning. 
I'm coming to terms with the, the context and the language he used to write, right, which was very specifically French, and, and the kind of potential for the concepts that he was articulating in that language. I don't really speak French enough to understand it that way. So for me, there is already a kind of distance in the question of translation. Um, and also, I, I learned about this in the context of, um, of a conference that happened in Guadalupe that was put together by Tilting Axis, which is an, organ an incredible organization that is centering the conversation to speak about the Caribbean context in art. Uh, and this, they, it had, this conference has happened in, in different places. Uh, Lisan was a major figure in the, in the Guadalupe context. So to me, it is really anchored in understanding the Caribbean Black experience and how these words written by Glissant were really addressing the condition of that time and that geography. And so for me, at this point, I'm still learning. I'm kind of like, you know, putting my hands all over it and seeing how it will make sense for me uh, and how it will filter through my own work. It might be that it doesn't. It might be that it, it will become just a reference, right? Uh, that is very anchored to a specific moment in time and a specific group of people, um, and it won't it won't make sense for me. But I like the, I like what I the, what I'm coming in contact with, uh, and what it allows me to um, think about in relationship to these absences in the colonial archive that I've been talking about. How, in fact, and as I said at the beginning, this the the fact that someone didn't make it to the archive, didn't make it to history might in fact be um, a, a really interesting form of um, radical uh, uh, absence, so to speak. Because everyone who didn't make it to that means that they managed to escape the rules of, of, uh, of uh, the normative rules of the system at the time. I'm going to take my privilege as the moderator and ask Carol one more question. <laughs> Have there been points recently in your work, given what's happening in Poland uh, these days, where you have felt a desire to become more opaque or to, uh, to res have you felt the need? Uh, and is that something that you fear happening? You know, is the, the like need or the desire to, um, for self-preservation for whatever reasons to kind of withdraw or, or absent yourself? Oh, I'm not sure if I answered this question well, but I, I, I also wanted to refer to what uh, I think uh, Carlos said uh, uh, before that it's important about uh, the collaboration, how you give the space. So for me, it's the moment now I have the feeling that maybe sometimes I should <laughs> take a break or be in the shadow because of the what I see, what is happening. And uh, there is first time I see that there is a lot of voices that need uh, not maybe not the word representation, but I think in the previous conversation, Carlos used this word like solidarity is not about representation, but about collaboration. So I totally agree with that. And I'm trying to incorporate more because sometimes when you're doing the pioneer work with the archives, everything is on you and you feel like everything, it depends on you because nobody will do this job for free. So, or be not interested enough to do it. So I get to the moment that I feel maybe I reached the point that I could share, I have to share much more space to, so the other voices could be heard. For, for my personal kind of feeling, how I feel in Poland now, it's rather I, uh, also because of the lockdowns and pa the pandemia, it's more like I really also step back a bit and working <laughs> on myself, but I, I, I attend the protest and I'm trying to, and it's also interesting for me that this time there are not like uh, queer protests or marches, but I, Immediately, I'm in a position that I'm just participating one, as one of the participants not being uh, responsible for the organization and stuff and so on, so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's important. I think that there's a, um, uh, I think that there's this kind of need for us to kind of each in our own positionalities be able to withdraw, um, even if it's just to, to collaborate in this way of handing over space. Um, so, um, we have one more question, um, actually of both Carl and Carlos from 
Yasmin um, to keep, to keep locating each of your work in art gallery, museum, foundation collections compared to perhaps an archive. How do these objects fluctuate in the two worlds of the of the indexical? <laughs> we should start. I don't know. I can just briefly say that for, for me again, to, it's a really interesting moment when the new institutions are doing collections. So for to reach the collection of Polish National Museum or Polish Museum of Modern Art with the queer work, with the queer team, it's very subversive and I see how it works and it's like the whole challenge. But we already have the negotiation what will remain in the Queer Archives Institute and what will go to the museum as a part of the work or how it's deal with that. and. Uh, I think uh, even from my personal work, I'm just saying, okay, this is staying because this is for the my new institution that it's supposed to have completely different rules. So mm -hmm. I'm building my own collection also by exchanging works with other artists. I'm just, it's a growing collection. So I'm, yeah, it's, it's a different politics. Do you have anything to add, Carlos? Uh, no, I, I think I agree with, uh, with Carol. Okay. Well, I think that's a good point to end on. I, you know, just thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carlos. It's been wonderful. Um, and I've really enjoyed myself. I learned a lot. <laughs> and um, I don't know if um, if uh, anyone from RU or the Polish Institute wants to close out the evening. We didn't talk about that part. So um, jump on in if you want to. Otherwise, I'll just say goodbye for all of us. I I just want to say thank you. It's been an amazing learning experience. And um, Laura also for moderating so brilliantly and so organically, you know, it's just been such a fluid, fluid conversation. And I'm very grateful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm always sorry at the end of these things that we can't all go out for a drink together because it always feels the it's the worst part of the Zoom experience is not being able to have the casual convo afterwards. Yes. But, um, this is exactly what I so wanted much. to say. Let's go for a beer. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, Laura, thank you so much for uh, doing the role of the moderator and uh, being so um, uh, wonderful and uh, navigating you know swiftly between all the a variety of topics and it was very important to have you also uh, because of uh, the recent role of the museum archives and um, the legitimizing of the institutional status of lgbtq and the perspective of the museums in querying the you know the histories so i, I really uh, enjoy that you address that and um, also in the context of how the, uh, the trend for museums to redefine uh, permanent collections and, uh, 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 you know, the very trendy uh, and uh, popular uh, uh, exhibitions, triennials, biennials, to emphasize the image of acceptance and integration and in, uh, inclusiveness. Um, so uh, I'm very much looking forward to your book, also uh, from the context, you know, the point of view, point of entry, um, uh, of an institution and um, um, and uh, someone who's holding uh, that position. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining and um, uh, looking forward to the next series, which is coming up in February, beginning February 4 to uh, 15. Thank you. Happy thank and you. healthy new year, everyone. Bye-bye.